So today I will continue with the uh, coverage based on the presentation which I had shared with you. Uh, and we had spoken about some of the basic uh, objectives of uh, public deliberation. Uh, public deliberation, of course, can take place in, in different forms, uh, in different spaces, in different kinds of social settings. Uh, so obviously what we are saying uh, in the context of public speaking or, or mass communication uh, may only partially apply when it comes to academic writing. Uh, so there are some similarities between other forms of mass communication, such as what you would normally find uh, in a newspaper or a news website, uh, in, in comparison to what you might find in an essay or a, or a law review article. Uh, but there are also some technical differences, right, which we have to get used to as we get into the habit of reading uh, and producing them uh, in the long run. Uh, so it was with that general perspective in mind that we continued with our discussion. Uh, and uh, before we ended uh, on Wednesday, uh, I was just talking about some of the larger reasons uh, for why some kinds of communication prevail uh, in a given socio-political setting. And sometimes with changes in demography, changes in the concentration of the population, uh, you also find changes in the kind of communication which prevails. Uh, so this is, of course, a slightly more complicated theme, uh, which one can take, uh, which one can look at with considerable depth, uh, depending on the particular country or context. Uh, that you might want to examine. Uh, but uh, I was simply making a slight, a general set of points uh, by talking about how sometimes it is the design of the public places or, or the nature of the platform or the opportunities uh, for communication, uh, which also eventually shape uh, what kind of communication is likely to be more effective. Uh, and then based on public feedback on based on the quality of engagement, uh, you can possibly look at how uh, communication has to be structured differently uh, depending on the space or the say, setting that you're part of. Uh, so you're right, uh, as, as Dr. Uma says, uh, there are courses, especially in communication studies, uh, and even I've heard of this in English honors courses, uh, where you actually can have a full course just focused uh, on skills of rhetoric. Uh, so, so you can possibly, um, you know, uh, there is material out there uh, which is focused narrowly on how to develop arguments in a partisan way, how to put forward arguments in a more effective way. Uh, but a lot of it then either moves in, in the direction of comparative debate. There is there are some uh, there are some scholarly subfields which move in that direction. Uh, but I guess the mainstream uh, application of this is more in journalism school, uh, where you focus on how to create content which gets attention, or how to create content where you deliver the content in a far more uh, media in in a, in a public friendly way. So it, it is a specialized uh, subject in some other disciplines. Uh, in law, the element of rhetoric does play a role. Uh, but again, it's not central uh, to what a legal scholar has to do, uh, because very often our job is to look past the rhetoric as well, right? It's not just how you construct your own arguments, how you put them forward in a structured way, and how you work through your reasons with examples, uh, but it's also how you look at the other side's arguments, uh, respond to them, dissect them, uh, construct responses. Uh, and of course, as we said in the earlier thread, uh, that uh, while uh, legal studies often prioritize this adversarial form of argumentation, which is derived from the older dialectic method uh, developed in the social sciences uh, by older scholars such as Hegel or Karl Marx. Uh, we often find that in contemporary legal scholarship, uh, there is a clear emphasis on why adversarial forms of communication might actually be uh, not proper uh, in many situations, right? So, uh, so it might be proper when you're talking about an issue that affects groups which have considerable bargaining power to be able to respond to each other uh, in ele through electoral institutions, through markets, through civil society institutions. But a dominant majority uh, and a suppressed minority can also touch on a disadvantage, uh, such as those based on caste, gender, a sexual disability amongst other grounds. Uh, so in such situations, uh, the adversarial form of communication might actually be counterproductive uh, because very often, uh, it is the people from the dominant group or the dominant identity who are more accustomed to these methods of rhetoric. And hence, they might actually be able to use these skills uh, to defend a position that is harmful uh, for society at large. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, the ability to construct arguments, the ability to speak effectively is always going to be a beneficial skill, right? I mean, rhetoric has also been used for negative ends such as state-led propaganda uh, and certainly uh, very often to suppress minority or disadvantaged standpoints as well. So we have to think about this in a slightly open-ended way, right? Just because uh, just because law students uh, are expected to develop a certain logical form of reasoning does not mean uh, that we use it in all situations. So it's like any other ability, right? 
it also to where the use of that skill can take on a negative color and might actually be harmful uh, to the causes that you want to work work with uh, so i took some generic examples of course uh, if you get into a communication studies course uh, or a journalism course you will find uh, elaborate studies on each of these examples and there are many more uh, in fact these days as i said last time uh, because we are constantly dealing with the problem of fake news and disinformation uh, on various outlets such as tv channels or even social or social media uh, the examples that you can pick in today's context are of course far more complicated uh, than many of these historical examples uh, where we saw a change in the medium or method of communication and what kind of impact it had uh, on the style that you would adopt uh, to persuade or convince others uh, so this is more of a background uh, let's uh, also look at what uh, i had to say in my in, in terms of uh, what kind of deliberative spaces uh, can play an effective role uh, so one example that uh, i found very fascinating because i had some engagement with theater in my high school i mean that's about 20 years ago uh, where the discussion was not so much on creating the most entertaining play or writing the script which gets the most laughs right uh, because generally that's the kind of theater that you would do uh, if you are participating in a play in a high school or under that or college context right you want to create a play which people will laugh at or will enjoy uh, and obviously sometimes uh, the peer pressure is such that you want the approval of your peers uh, but those who study theater systematically and seriously say that uh, if you look at the evolution of indian theater uh, the stages in the development of indian theater actually reflect very different approaches uh, to the way in which you are enabling a communication with your audience uh, so the root question is how do we create seemingly egalitarian settings that enable participation as opposed to spaces that reinforce a top down imposition of views and the reason i am bringing up this example of theater is because there is an analogy to be drawn with the way in which a regular classroom uh, functions so of course it doesn't apply to our interaction right now because we are all sitting in front of our screens either in front of a laptop or in front of a smartphone uh, to participate in these classes and obviously here also the teachers are in a position of authority which we are using to deliver most of the content and then to manage the discussion uh, when we want to take on views uh, from students but in a traditional classroom right uh, the authority of the teacher is not just reflected in the way in which we communicate verbally but also sometimes in the way in which the physical space uh, is designed uh, so in the traditional classroom right uh, the teacher normally stands on a podium uh, or on a porch uh, and then speaks I'm sorry not a porch but sometimes the elevated space uh, and then speaks to the students uh, who are then supposed to receive information and then engage with the material but very often uh, and 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 i guess now many people are are attending schools of different kinds so you will find that uh, many of the classrooms that you have attended actually have a slightly different design these days so rather than the traditional design where the teacher speaks from a uh, elevated space and is the politician put uh, the opposition benches uh, in a mini parliament so in fact if you look at the design of the main classrooms in nalsar uh, they are designed like mini parliaments right so you have a 80 seater classroom and a 60 seater classroom about 10 of them uh, the other some classrooms of course are the older uh, rectangular forms uh, but most the 10 major classrooms actually have a semi circular design uh, so that it creates a sense that people can participate in the discussion uh, rather than simply receiving information so that, and and the teachers uh, is not elevated right the teacher stands in the floor in the middle and in fact the students uh, are sitting at an elevated space uh, with the steps going upwards so that's a design now which is used in many classrooms uh, this method began especially with business schools in the us they started building these uh, semi circular classrooms and that has now become the more prominent design in the newer universities but many of you would recall your school or college spaces where you had a rectangular classroom and the teacher would be elevated so the question is that uh, it's not just the kind of persons who are occupying those spaces but it's also sometimes the design of those spaces uh, which reflects the kind of interaction that takes place between the participants uh, in the academic space uh, but having said that the analogy with theater is interesting uh, because students of indian theater say that indian theater has gone through basically three stages of evolution uh, there is the older a uh, form of theater called stage theater or proscenium theater proscenium is just a technical word for stage theater uh, which was most prominent when we look at the sanskritic tradition of plays or the classical tradition of plays be it in tamil telugu or marathi uh, and uh, much of the movement towards folk theater right which of course is not new in india we've had folk theater for thousands of years in some states uh, where performance is not happening in a stage uh, or in a closed space uh, but actually out in the open right where people actually perform street plays uh, on the street 
uh, which are either on contemporary social or economic or political issues. And sometimes you have very elaborate forms of folk theater uh, that combine elements of music and dance uh, with popular forms of entertainment. So, so the argument is that as opposed to the mainstream understanding of theater, which looks for a story playing out on a stage, an audience watching it, and an audience then paying uh, possibly uh, possibly paying a price for it, for watching that performance to patronize the artists. A street theater of folk theater does not follow the same logic, right? A street theater of folk theater is described as a form of entertainment for the people. Uh, and almost every state in India has its own distinctive form of street theater, right? So, for example, in Tamil Nadu, uh, you have a form of street theater called Therukutu, uh, which is actually very elaborate, right? It has very elaborate scenes of war, of, of dance, of music. Uh, and it takes a lot of effort uh, if you if some of you have in fact seen those performances uh, similarly in, in karnataka uh, classical form dance forms have been fused with with popular theater forms uh, and a great example of that is yakshagana uh, which actually is a narration of of the story of the ramayan but in a slightly more elongated way uh, and the performances happen in a village courtyard uh, with the audiences surrounding you from three sides and the performers perform all night uh, and uh, if you look at the northern states which is the part of the country which i come from uh, Haryana or Uttar Pradesh, uh, you've always had the Ramlila tradition, right? Where, where uh, especially around the Shara, uh, you have the elaborate recollection of the story of the Ramayan uh, on stage, sometimes in a musical form, sometimes in a dramatic form. Uh, and similarly, if you if you go to travel to other parts of the country, uh, whether it is Manipur or whether it is Punjab, uh, you'll find distinctive forms of street theater or folk theater, uh, which have evolved uh, in, the, in, those, in those states. Uh, so the difference between street theater, uh, folk theater, and and stage theater is that stage theater is assuming the classical model of the performers uh, being in a position of, of prominence and the audience watching them, uh, whereas street theater or folk theater tends to take on a more interactive color uh, because a lot of it also depends on the needs and interests of the community for whom you are performing. A third uh, sort of uh, version which has emerged now in the 20th century uh, is called alternative theater which tries to break free of these older categorizations of stage theater or folk theater and focuses more on what the actual message is. Uh, so, if, uh, so, so, so one of the most important playwrights in India who's associated with this alternative theater tradition uh, was Badal Sarkar, who passed away a few years ago. He was Calcutta based, but he really popularized the approach called the Angan Manch. Uh, Angan literally is a courtyard uh, where uh, his group would actually travel to different villages in Bengal uh, and they would perform for the farmers and the workers who otherwise would not have access to popular forms of entertainment. So he also suggested that you can pretty much use any physical space available to you for putting out a theatrical production. So it changes the understanding of a play. Uh, rather than it having an elaborate structure uh, of being performed on the stage uh, or the alternative idea of a street play which is based on song and dance uh, or mimicry, uh, alternative theatre in fact defies these categories and tries to be responsive to the needs of the audience. So some of you of course would have had exposure uh, but uh, the reason why I bring up this analogy is not just because of my own limited experience with this uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, but also how we look at the parallels with these approaches when it comes to formal communication. Uh, for instance, even when we talk about uh, writing, let's say in the academic space, uh, there, is a, there are differences between the kind of writing that needs to be done uh, for specialized and more refined audiences, something akin to the stage play where you sell tickets and you get a small audience to watch your performance on stage. Uh, then the approach in journalistic writing or writing meant for mass consumption has to be different uh, because you want your message to be understood by a large number of people. You want to use simpler language. Uh, so in a way that is comparable to street theater or folk theater, uh, which is also responsive to the needs of your, uh, your needs of your audience. Uh, and alternative theater could be perhaps a via media category where you defy these categorizations uh, and you focus on the creative process. So that's why the broad analogy is something which I think is useful to think through. Uh, even when we look at uh, the production of writing. Uh, so let's uh, move on to some other questions now, which I think are connected to what uh, what the field of professional ethics also asks us. Uh, and, and I think that's where I would like to bring the discussion closer to our requirements. So obviously, one may ask a larger question, uh, what is the place of rhetoric or argumentation in our society? And even in ancient Greece, uh, Plato and Socrates recorded some early philosophical objections. So Plato, of course, was a pupil of Socrates. Uh, Socrates never wrote down what he was saying. So much of his, most of his speeches or orations were recorded by his students. And Plato was, of course, his most uh, well-known student because he documented those ideas and uh, those texts have been passed on. Uh, so Plato, who was recording the opinions of his, of his teacher, Socrates, 
uh, recorded some early philosophical objections to the nature of arguments that they were that were taking place in ancient Athens because they were they were both from Athens, uh, which was a city state at that time. So one a criticism that we often find against uh, those of us who believe in the value of argumentation is that sophistry or the ability to put forward complex arguments can go to the extent of rationalizing tyranny. And this is something I was saying in a slightly more crude way a few minutes ago, that your ability to engage in rhetoric, your ability to create structured arguments uh, might be a force of good uh, in some situations, but they can also be several social settings where there are questions of stru structural disadvantage or inequality involved, where you might find that the invocation of your ability to create complex arguments might actually be defending a positions which are harmful or wrongful. Uh, so very often we see it in the context of 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 of, uh, of of intellectuals speaking out in favor of autocrats, and and that's happening in many countries these days. Uh, or for that matter, even mass media or journalism are basically taking a side uh, that that favors the exclusion or the exploitation of a smaller minority group. So uh, so so please remember uh, the abilities that we often develop and nurture uh, in a law school context or in communication studies uh, can both be a force of good, but can also be a force of evil. Uh, and, and that's something that we have to be reflective about and think through uh, as we develop these skills. Uh, second, a point which I guess many of you would have heard uh, from your own peers and also from your own families, uh, that sometimes excessive skepticism or what we call the problem of overthinking, uh, excessive skepticism and argumentation uh, creates hurdles for decision making. And sometimes it makes it difficult to act with expediency. So especially when you're making decisions in larger groups, when you're trying to persuade many people to act in the same way or to agree on a common path of action, uh, the tendency to listen to everyone's point of view or the arguments made by everyone uh, might actually obstruct decision making. Uh, and it might make it difficult for you to make decisions uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, in fact, some of you, in fact, might have read the story about uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, uh, the current CEO of the Niti Aayog, which was earlier, in fact, the planning commission who apparently observed that India has too much democracy, <laughs> which is why it is difficult to implement reforms. Uh, so these days, people are not even hiding their opinion uh, that they want India to become an autocratic country. Uh, but I mean, irrespective of why he was saying that, uh, that point resonates with this criticism, because very often, whether it is politics, whether it is economics, or whether it is social relations, uh, you may find there are numerous situations where people lose patience uh, with arguments and criticism and skepticism, and they simply want decisions to be made. Uh, now, it is perhaps this anxiety uh, or this impatience with the chaotic nature of India's democracy, uh, which has led people to support a party or a leader uh, who perhaps has, does not have the same degree of tolerance for dialogue, uh, which many of the older uh, previous prime ministers did. But again, that's a moment which we have to live through, uh, because this is the decision that uh, that our electoral system has made. Uh, third, a point which I guess uh, resonates more directly with us as law students uh, or as people who want to be professionals in law, uh, advocates or rhetoricians are like clouds, right? They can argue different positions depending on their short-term interests. So very often the point that is made is that uh, if you look at the best advocates professionally, I mean not best advocates in an ethical or moral sense, but if you look at the people who are making the most money uh, in terms of their appearances before the Supreme Court or the High Courts, or even for that matter, the district courts, you find that it's not just people with reputational capital or seniority who are doing well, but it's actually people who have the ability to analyze the same set of facts or the same set of problems from different points of view. Uh, that not only are you able to put forward your client's arguments very effectively, but if you were hypothetically given the brief of the government or the opposing side, uh, argue it equally well. Equally well. So the question is that uh, as an advocate or a rhetorician, Sometimes this ability to argue the same position from different points of view is valued. Uh, in fact, even in academic writing, we are saying that your ability to anticipate objections, your ability to preempt disagreements. Able to mute. Uh, Ma'am, do you want to say something? I think your no, mic no, was no, on. No, I'm, I'm trying to mute it and it's for some reasons, there's some problem in my computer. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. no problem. So, so when we look at uh, the ability to respond to certain positions, as we said, uh, very often when you're writing a writ petition uh, or you're preparing a memorandum, uh, it's not enough to think about the best possible arguments that you can bring to the table, right? Sometimes you also have to anticipate uh, what the other side is going to say or what the obvious rebuttals to your position are. So in that sense, we value it as a skill, right? This ability to argue different positions, 
depending on the needs of your client or depending on the needs of the situation. But remember, uh, when you decide on who to represent or who to argue for or what kind of arguments to make, uh, then this ability to change sides uh, or the ability to look at the same issue differently can also cause considerable uh, anxiety and considerable distress, especially on part of the clients. So one very popular criticism of lawyers is that lawyers are not to be trusted uh, because they will pretty much argue the case for whoever is paying them uh, to appear in that case or to advise in that particular transaction. So this is, of course, a question that resonates with all of us uh, because we'll find ourselves in this situation at some point uh, or the other. Uh, though I guess the first two points are more relevant for our larger uh, political discourse, uh, that to what extent are we willing to engage in a process of reasoned argument? To what extent are we willing to give a platform to those uh, who are completely different from us in their background, in their views, uh, in their upbringing and their way of thinking? Uh, and what exactly is a via media or a reasonable sort of uh, a reasonable uh, uh, middle ground uh, where people with different situations, different so social backgrounds can come together and discuss and solve problems. So, of course, we talk about the idea of deliberation as an ideal. Uh, and there is a reason why we call it an ideal, uh, because there are many real situations where you don't find this happening, right? Where people either lose patience uh, with others who have different opinions or, or perhaps because of entrenched differences based on ethnicity or social or economic background, uh, that dialogue never takes place. So especially for those of you who might be interested in uh, ADR methods, uh, especially mediation or negotiation, uh, it's important to think uh, about these criticisms uh, and to then think about what potentially can be done better to either avoid these criticisms or to lessen the impact of these uh, criticisms. Uh, then another set of questions which I'll put forward before asking for your views uh, is that historically also there is a place for rhetoric or argumentation in the way in which Western societies change from largely religious societies to towards, let's say, the idea of modern secularism, which happens broadly in the 17th and 18th century. Now, one would argue that uh, this process of transitioning from religious societies to secular societies has not really effectively happened uh, in countries such as ours or in countries in most parts of Asia, Africa or Latin America, which were under colonial rule. Uh, because for us, these models of secularism were in fact imported from the West and were not organically grown uh, in our country. Of course, there are opposing arguments who say that this is false because uh, countries like ours also have a tradition of secularism that goes back to our history. Uh, so, so, so one possible uh, idea that uh, one would encounter, especially when you study intellectual history, is how does the Enlightenment period, especially the 17th or 18th century in Europe, emphasize the, the rejection of traditional authority based on the authority of the church or organized religion and requires a shift away towards the power of the elected parliament, uh, which is both based more on dialogue and discussion. So we see such, such a transition playing out in England uh, in, the, in the 17th century and certainly uh, on account of the revolutions which happened towards the end of the 18th century, uh, this transition becomes far more faster. Now, again, we have to think about these as complex historical processes that play out over decades and in some cases centuries. Uh, but certainly you find that in comparison to the older tradition of respecting the authority of the church or the priests, because they were the only communities that were controlling knowledge in medieval Europe. Uh, and you contrast it that, that with the modern society where knowledge is in fact disseminated to many other sections of society. You obviously have a fundamental change uh, in the way in which we look at the idea of the connection between authority, uh, the, the authority of the state and the authority of religion. Uh, one would argue that in India, we've not really had such an organic transition and there are pockets of the country uh, which have accepted this discourse of secular democracy. Uh, but there are many other, which are other sections of our country which are perhaps in a numerical majority uh, which don't believe uh, in a secular democracy and would very much uh, tend to stick on to their old religious beliefs. And that's of course a, a, a conflict that plays out at multiple levels uh, in today's politics. So how do we locate the importance of public discourse uh, in drawing the distinctions between democracy and authoritarianism in our era? I think that's the immediate question that we should be asking, uh, especially with the crackdown on, on civil society groups uh, and the arrest of many people who have tried to offer criticisms of legislation uh, in the recent past, be it the CA or be it, uh, or be it the false arrests in the, in the Bhima Koregao case. It's completely a false case. I can say that with complete confidence. And obviously, uh, for those of you who have studied constitutional law, uh, we often spend time on the freedom of speech and expression uh, as an important element uh, which, is, which safeguards modern democracy. So it doesn't really matter who is in power, uh, but you have to create an adequate space for citizens and civil society groups to be able to express their views 
uh, and to be able to discuss their differences uh, in public. So these are some generic points which I think uh, we should consider. Uh, of course, we can get into some of these points with a lot more depth uh, if we were to study a course on constitutional law. But I wanted to foreground all of these questions uh, before we get into some of the procedural parts of uh, how we go about constructing arguments on how we go about rebutting them. Uh, so before I proceed, I just wanted to go back to the previous slide and pause here because I've been going on and on <laughs> to see if anybody has anything to say uh, in response to the points that I've made on this particular slide, right? On, on slide number 10, uh, which is also a file available to you, uh, where I've asked uh, what are the early philosophical, what, what were the early objections uh, that were made against the use of rhetoric or argumentation in our society? Uh, so do you think these are the most obvious points? Uh, I mean, you, you would have thought about them anyway. Uh, or would someone like to build on these uh, and say there are other reasons why we should be skeptical uh, about the place of rhetoric or argumentation in our society? Or if you have any reactions uh, to what has been said so far? Or, or do you think that uh, we don't need to worry about these criticisms? Because uh, ultimately, if you want to be a successful advocate uh, or a legal advisor, then you have to brush aside these criticisms, right? Uh, they are academic criticisms, and we have to focus on getting things done uh, for our client. Excuse me, sir. Right, please. Yeah. Sir, so uh, my view is, uh, so basically, what I think is, uh, in the olden days or in the ancient times, there was no social media, what we have today. So I think the way in which we need to look at uh, criticism is actually to be completely different in today's time sir so because people's accessibility is pretty high dissemination is now a tool for everybody so even if with a one click anybody can express anything just like you told Nithya CEO even you or I can also do the same thing in the next second so so I think there is a need to relook the concept of rhetoric in today's perspective okay so so you're saying it's not just the uh, content of what you're saying around which the discussion is framed, uh, but the fact that we can communicate instantly, uh, we can circulate personal opinions very quickly, which would never happen historically, right? I mean, earlier, uh, if you were sending your work for publication, uh, if you were publishing a book, it would go through several rounds of editing, you know, before it would hit the printing press. Uh, even if you were communicating on TV or radio, uh, the economic resources were limited, so very few people would get the chance to, you know, perform or speak uh, on mass media. Uh, but with social media and the internet, things have changed, right? I mean, anyone who owns a smartphone or has a laptop uh, can pretty much, you know, communicate or express whatever they have in mind, uh, even if that is an uninformed view, right, or an unformed view, uh, as 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 uh, Barack Obama referred to one of our political leaders, that he's an unformed person. So, so it's quite possible that those of us who don't have any expertise or any understanding of a subject uh, might actually gang up against those who actually know the subject. Right, which is frequently happening on the internet, right? In fact, the common joke is uh, that many people who, who habitually troll others on, on the internet are usually people with low self-confidence, uh, you know, who are finding the ability to express or, or find, express themselves online as a way of liberating themselves because otherwise they feel that they feel suppressed in their actual lives, right? So, in fact, this is a very ironic thing that very often people who you meet in real life who happen to be very polite or introverted or slightly subdued uh, are actually likely to be far more aggressive in their online avatars, right? I mean, this is one observation that uh, people studying behavior on the internet have made. Uh, whereas those who are very extremely confident uh, in their social life or in person might ex demonstrate some parts of that confidence online, but it may not be consistent. So, so the way in which we create our digital avatar or the way in which we communicate with others uh, over, over Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp uh, would be very different from, let's say, the kind of interactions uh, that we have might in real uh, might have in real life, and the key point is that at least in real life there are numerous moderating in influences on us. Right? If we participate in a classroom discussion, uh, we are normally concerned about what our peers might think of us or what the teacher might think of us. Right? Or uh, if we participate even in let's say a public gathering, uh, you are mindful about what others need to do or the sense that there is a community interest involved. Uh, but with with online communication, since you are sitting physically alone with your device. Uh, or you're sitting, uh, or sometimes you're offering comments anonymously, uh, you don't often have that sense of responsibility or accountability uh, to the people around you. So there's a lot of interesting scholarship now, right, which is coming uh, on the on what the changes 
on, on what what the nature of social interactions on on the internet have done to us. And I guess some of you might have seen this uh, documentary which has come recently, uh, the social dilemma, right? Uh, have 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 people seen it? You can just say yes or no in the chat or uh, speak up. Has anyone seen that documentary recently, social dilemma? Okay, well, ma'am has of course. I mean, she's a she's a language teacher, so she of course uh, you know would keep up with this material. Uh, but I, I'm asked, amongst the students, have some people seen it? Oh, excellent. Uh, so in fact, it's a highly recommended uh, documentary because uh, I guess many of you, I mean, like me, I, I will admit to it also. Uh, we end up spending too much time on social media. Uh, I, I mean, at some point, of course, uh, social media was just an incidental sort of hobby. Uh, but these days, you know, many of us are in fact using it to advance our professional interests uh, as well. Uh, I mean, I, I do post on Facebook, but I don't post it very often. I Usually it is either an article which I have th thought which is very relevant or interesting. Uh, or sometimes, you know, you post personally about things which have happened in your family or something that you observe. But it's very infrequent. Let's say in a week, maybe one or two posts. Uh, but there are some people who I find are posting, you know, five or six times a day, sometimes much more than that. Uh, some people are sharing private details of their lives online. Uh, and of course, there's a larger ethical question about uh, whether you should be sharing images or, or or words about your own immediate family members without their consent. So there are questions about privacy involved. And there are many others, right, who, of course, use social media for getting into political arguments, fighting with their relatives. <laughs> and uh, that seems to also be a problem for most of us. So the root issue is that many of us, in fact, are now spending almost two to three hours, uh, you know, just browsing through our social media accounts, uh, which it is, is possibly taking time away from the other productive work that we should be doing. Uh, in our lives. Uh, and the pandemic might have actually made it worse, right? Uh, I mean, I don't know if, if that resonates with most of your experience, uh, but if in the pandemic, if you were sitting at home uh, with other activities shut off, especially in the summer months, I mean, now I guess people are going to shops and moving, moving around. Uh, you know, virtually you were trapped at home and you were mostly online if you had that facility. So this is, of course, a larger, I think, uh, question that requires uh, discussion. And I think, Sankarshan, you're right. Uh, even what we think uh, what 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 the meaning of good argumentation is uh, has possibly changed, right? I mean, in fact, we see it clearly clearly in the political discourse, uh, where arguments which were considered on face value ten years ago are now dismissed as the opinions of the elite, uh, and arguments which were considered to be unfiltered uh, and raw are now seen as authentic uh, because more people are able to express them uh, online. Uh, so the very idea of what constitutes a valid argument or what constitutes a socially acceptable way of uh, of speaking also changes uh, and the nature of the medium uh, and the format of communication has a big role to play uh, in identifying what are these norms of argumentation. Uh, so before I proceed, uh, does anyone want to say something about... Um... Excuse me, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good morning, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask if what uh, to what extent does language play a role in putting uh, uh, across a point? Like uh, these days, even meaningless use of language, but in, a, in an exaggerated and impressive style, that is being classified as rhetoric. And uh, mo uh, the, the, some uh, in a way, the attention is being shifted from the content that is being put forth vis-a-vis uh, -vis the language that is being used. So some people are also getting confused and of course social media has a role to play that yeah. uh, if they can share their views with the, in an impressive style. So it uh, invariably favors the person who has an advantage of using an impressive language rather than uh, as compared to a person who uses a plain language but puts forth a su substantial point. So yeah, ex yeah, excellent question. In fact, uh, uh, you know, this question, I, I remember this question being asked uh, when I was a first year student uh, in 2003, uh, and we were being introduced to this in our own legal methods course. And we had the same question for our professor. And, uh, you know, he gave us a very interesting answer because, I mean, he's now not an NLS, he's, he's at Azim Premji University, uh, Professor Sitaram Kakarala. Uh, and he was, in fact, our political science teacher, but he took some classes for legal methods. And I think he, uh, he gave us a pretty good answer. He says, and it resonates with what you're saying. He said that most of you who have entered this college at this point in time, I mean, that was 17 years ago, are from uh, elite English speaking schools in the large cities in India. Uh, most of you have, have parents, right, who have gone to college. Some of us have grandparents who have gone to college. Uh, and obviously, the kind of social segment that we came from, right, as the incoming class at NLS in 2003, uh, is not representative of the larger reality in Indian politics, right? And he said that uh, most of you have parents who have who are senior bureaucrats. Somebody's father is a judge. Somebody's father is a businessman, 
that my own family has relatively uh, is is quite comfortable financially and very few students in fact right came from uh, Im- impoverished backgrounds so he used that as a immediate point of reference because i guess as 18 year olds you need that immediate context or example uh, but then he moved on to the same point that you are making uh, that because we have that extent of familiarity with the english language and a certain social capital and a way of speaking and dressing we might start believing that our arguments are valid right even when we talk to others who are actually more directly affected by the issues but perhaps don't have the language or the articulation to put forward their view and i guess you know as you get older you realize how true that is uh because very often you know in the comparative space of a law school or the comparative space of an, of an undergraduate education we tend to be very self centered right we think about uh, what will help me get better grades what will help me in creating a better impression amongst my peers uh, or my teachers right or what will help me in terms of my cv building right those are normal things for law students to be thinking about but i guess the more the far further you get away from college or the further you get away from that 18 to 22 age group the more you realize that what you were doing at that age group was actually quite misplaced and wrong uh for instance i have had direct experiences uh, of, of talking to people right who have uh, who have basically worked in a certain setting either as farmers or all as industrial workers uh, and obviously they are far more knowledgeable about the matter that they are dealing with so who am i as an outsider to come and talk to them about whether the current labor law reform is better or whether the current farm bills are better i mean i'm just connecting it to a current example but it speaks to the same point uh, that you're making uh, so you're right i mean this distinction between plain language and and an impressive language is perhaps more of a discussion for people like us right because even amongst us there are differences in the way in which uh, we have access to the english language so that shapes our vocabulary some of us have a more advanced vocabulary some of us don't have such an advanced vocabulary and that often creates the impression that so and so is arguing better or so and so has a more valid point but uh, but you're right in in the long run when we look at the validity of a position when we look at the ethical content of a position uh, or the moral principles that are being discussed i think those are more important so so whether it is this debate about plain language or complex language right or whether it is the distinction between uh, the language used by the educated classes and the language used by the working classes i think we have to be very mindful of this uh, because it's a very common mistake for us to make uh, especially those of us who have university education uh, you know we tend to think that we know better uh, especially when it comes to solving social problems uh, and it plays out in many ways i mean not just in a in a in a formal space where you're communicating or debating uh, but certainly even in your everyday acts uh, i mean this year i'm sure you know uh, many of us have had to contribute money to help others who were in distress uh but sometimes you know are we simply giving money as an act of charity or are we uh, giving money simply to show that you know we are in a position to give that's that's a far more complicated you know debate uh, are, are we actually are our acts of charity also a form of showing that look we are higher up in the class pedestal and hence we are capable of giving so those are complex moral questions i i i don't think they have easy answers uh but you're absolutely right i think uh, uh, much of the problem that we've had in india is that because of the colonial baggage that we've had uh this distinction between english and the other indian languages has become far too pronounced at least in the in the in the, pub, in, the in the world of publishing uh, in the world of formal knowledge creation and obviously as india integrates with the rest of the world through economic liberalization that awareness has even grown more that you know we need we need to be able to speak in english we need to be able to respond to others in english uh, but it, i mean let's accept the fact that a majority of indians still don't study english Uh, in their school right only a certain maybe a quarter of the schools uh, in in india are teaching in english so i think we have to be very attentive to this uh, distinction at all levels i mean not just the level that you raised uh, which is the use of plain and simpler language and complex language uh, but even let's say between university educated people and those who don't have university education i mean there might be differences in the style of communication but we must pay f- attention to the content or the substance of what is being said and uh, you know the interesting part is uh, the older that you get uh, the more uh, the more you realize that it is actually we have to pay more attention to the content or the substance uh, i mean at least that's my view i mean i'm sure there are others who can add to this uh, so i think ma'am has written some comments maybe you want to add uh, ma'am do you want to add because yes. I, i think Just your comment to... has uh, multiple strands so i think it's exactly. better if you speak so yeah. one uh... Uh, component that i mean at least two components that i am trying to uh, get you, to see in anjali's uh, question is 
that uh, we live in a in a in an unequal society with unequal access to all at every level of education and uh, existence therefore the kind of attitudes that you will have towards a language and the speakers of those languages is one major variable so people who speak english are seen in a certain way and people who speak english with a flair are seen in a in a in a more uh, uh, sophisticated manner and therefore what happens is that clouds are our judgment of the content that they are giving to their message so this is one aspect that you have to pay attention to the second aspect is that now as scholars that you as scholars you as lawyers you as responsible citizens in the society will now have to dissociate from that bias to see what is the content that is being delivered and that is that is why for me this uh, this question was in a way a test to one's critical thinking itself so if if the example of the national education policy that we have had this year different scholars from different backgrounds have reacted very differently for instance i am aware of uh, professor robert philipson saying that uh, india has not moved beyond uh, macaulay's uh, versions of uh, aspirations for english in india because professor robert philipson comes from a very british council background and for british council we are a million pound business in india you have to be conscious of the fact that british council comes up with with one major research project every 10 years and the outcome of the research project is always the need for english in india you can't miss it 1980s there was a project 1990s there was a project 2000 there was a project 2010 english next came in the form of a big book it has already come up with six editions and in 2018 there was this multilingual education project that british council did the outcome is the same that india needs english and nothing but english mm -hmm. so that's professor philipson's version when you move from there to one of the public policy lectures that siddharth and uh, i mean as the coordinator had organized was to bring professor kancha ailaya to talk about the new education policy and kancha ailaya and professor ailaya is very clear good mother tongue medium education is required in india but what the dalits need is not just that we will take care of mother tongue at our homes what we need is english so there is a different pull and a push factor that you have to be conscious of and why are these positions coming out is something that you will have to um, consciously ask because that is where your own uh, rhetoric is going to come from that is where your own content is going to come from so i thought this question was neatly taking us into that direction of uh, critical thinking on one hand and being conscious of biases that people are putting forth in the other hand and uh paying also close attention to what siddharth was trying to get us to see ki where are these people coming from what are the kinds of backgrounds that they are coming from in order to have a position of this kind yeah. that's it thank you so much siddharth yeah. no so in fact uh, you know uh, uh, I, i mean uh, we have several colleagues in nalsa right who are now uh, doing empirical work i mean that was not the case a few years ago and uh, the common thread you know that i've understood from all of them whether it is dr uma who is working on uh, early childhood education Or, or or education in in, Chata, in chatisgarh or dr murli you know who is working with on prison reform uh, or for that matter dr manisha sethi you know who's worked on criminal justice you know all of them have said the same thing in one way or the other that while their own formal training obviously the writing of a thesis the right, their research methods orientations have all happened in english in the universities that they went to but whenever they did their field work right uh, it required them to learn additional languages right or sometimes to interact uh, through informants or translators which would enable them to get information from people right who were speaking in their own languages so uh, so these are just examples of people who you can talk to here in nalsar uh, but it's also a fact that you know uh, if you want to seriously investigate a social issue uh, then we have to step outside this bubble uh, that we create for ourselves uh, and and you know i'm deeply conscious of the fact that uh, in a place like nalsar these things might sound very uh, unconvincing because all of our instruction is in english uh so in that sense you know we might in fact be criticized for uh speaking in a way that is not accessible to all students uh, and and dr ruma i think you have also faced the same criticism as i have uh that very often uh, what we are saying in class often takes time for people to absorb or understand exactly. right exactly. i mean that's the feedback we have got and and and, exactly. and 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 so genuine feedback because uh, i think in india let's be very honest right we have different levels of access to the language and which is why i wanted to just recount that story from uh my own undergraduate days because uh the question was introduced to us at two levels right which is what i was trying to eventually say that at one level it was the way in which you have framing the question uh that should i necessarily try to complicate my use of language should should i develop those refinements 
should i pay attention to you know a more advanced vocabulary or should i concentrate on delivering my points in a simple logical accessible way uh, which can be read by more people and you know my answer would be that uh, in the long run you possibly need to do a little bit of both but as you engage with a larger audience as you as you write let's say not just for clients but also for larger public consumption i would possibly say always privilege substance over form right so even if let's say uh, your work doesn't straight away get accepted in peer reviewed journals uh, or you don't get admitted to a foreign university i mean that's fine i mean that's not the end of life i mean we have a big country where we have to contribute with our own resources and our capital to the needs of our own country uh, our own fellow citizens so so you know if you're able to write in a logically coherent fashion if your writing is understood by a much larger audience uh, i would say as a legal professional you might be more effective in that sense uh, and you know what we are saying i mean of course we took it to another level in terms of thinking about the discussion the, the distinction between english and the indian languages but what you are saying is equally true for the indian languages right even let's say within hindi literature uh, or even within marathi literature uh, you have this you know distinction between class and mass uh, so do i try to write like the uh, the people who belong to a high class background who are trying to speak to scholars from their own fields or do i write for the masses so that's another way in which we can you know unpack this question and think about its implications for us Uh, so sorry okay, yeah, so, yeah we took the, so one thing yeah, yeah. one one thing i wanted to add like uh, as you mentioned that one of the formal challenges that legal or maybe be it legal education or law awareness in india face in or in countries like india it faces is the legal ease so uh, slowly people have started realizing and if we start as legal as you mentioned as legal professionals if we start moving towards simpler language and uh, focusing on the substance and how to get it across uh, will it be like in a better form as you said that uh, putting the substance uh, giving it more priority yeah i th- i think i think at least at, at least in 2020 i would say i think confidently we should pursue that objective because uh, i mean there is already a plain language movement uh, plain legal writing in english movement in the west uh, but in india it's not just about plain writing in english it's about making that information available to people in their own languages languages yes so so which is why you know i mean i, I mean I, i i think i mentioned this example so i'm just repeating myself uh but uh, like professor fazan mustafa started his youtube channel 5 years ago and you know to be yes, completely sir. honest a lot of other legal scholars who i know in other universities you know and initially were jeering at him that you know what is this uh, he's a well known person why is he demoting himself and creating youtube videos you know they were making fun of him literally but the fact that you know he's explaining recent judgments and legislative developments in hindi in the last 5 years has actually given him a very different audience Mm. and and the only evidence you need to see of that is go to his youtube channel legal awareness web and i'm not saying comment on the quality i mean some videos are made with a lot of thought and care some are more content immediate comments so they may not be all that well formed but he's doing it in hindi mm. you know which is the operative difference and he's reaching out to a much larger audience of viewers in north india which you know most of us never reached out to so think about the impact that you know one person can have if he is able to simply translate what we are studying in the law school in 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 simple conversational hindi and he's done it right uh, in fact another example i can mention dr uma will remember we in fact had a llm student four student years ago priya jain uh, uh-huh. priya jain and you know priya to be jain. honest to be, i mean i mean i i hope she doesn't listen to this but to be honest you know in class <laughs> we felt we felt she was slightly indifferent to the studies that okay you know we'll do the degree and go but she's actually created a youtube channel where she's created so phenology legal exactly see yeah And you know, I, I, I'm now getting actually more, uh, rather than the students who went to Oxford or you know who went uh, abroad to study, I get more queries about her. That what did she do in law school? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so things can change, and, uh, and and these are just two examples of people you know who basically uh, said, okay, we have we are developing knowledge in a certain domain. Let's just make it accessible to a larger audience. So I know Priya is doing it with some commercial objectives in mind because she has built right. a business. Uh, but Professor Mustafa is doing it on a completely voluntary basis. I mean, there is no money paid. <laughs> I mean, even the advertising which YouTube gives us, we are not collecting it. So, uh, so, so thing is, these are models. But I'm sure there are now others who, who are doing it in their yeah. own languages. Yeah, Siddharth. I came across some recent interventions. I think by lawyers in Tamil Nadu. Yes, uh, the channel in Tamil. And, uh, and and definitely, you know, as as some of you as as LLM students, when you start working as advocates or in law firms, you will specialize in a certain practice area. So you know, there is a great demand for languages, and you will be surprised. You know, whether it is property law, whether it is banking law, whether it is family law, 
uh, you know, even even complex themes like arbitration, you can actually generate content in your own respective language, which will have an audience. So, so that's something you need to think about, right? Okay. From Bombay think, University as well, we now yeah. have uh, from Bombay University, you have a political science uh, a professor in Paul Science, who also has a degree in law, uh, working on a project wherein major uh, acts that are relevant for uh, the um, rural people in Maharashtra are now being converted into Marathi. Yeah, yeah. But this is this is th these are things that are happening across the country, but then they don't reach the kind of mainstream knowledge systems that are required. I mean, that are supposed to be uh, there for them. Rufus's work, of course, is very well known in Tamil Nadu because he translates the latest. He gets his team translates the latest judgments into Tamil the latest acts into Tamil, apart from just translating, what they do is they also give you a lot of notes on the side. So yeah. what has been the kind of interpretation in the past? How is it different? So that also begins to act like a very good reading material in mm. Tamil for law students in Tamil Nadu itself. Yeah. So it's so since we are on this side, you know, I, I, in fact, yeah, I mean, I, I should just mention two more examples for our students. Uh, like we have one of our alumni from Nalsar, Sunil Kumar, uh, you know, who's involved with the NGO called Landesa. Uh, and he's done some great work on on suggesting land reforms in Telangana, and he also creates content, you know, in Telugu exactly. or, or, or land review laws and state level laws. And you know, because of that public visibility and outreach that he did, the state government is now consulting him frequently uh, in you know overhauling the land laws in Telangana. Uh, and another example, you know, I can think of is that recently when these farm bills, uh, the protests were being organized in Punjab. A lot of the mainstream, you know, media, the not mainstream, <laughs> the the Godi media is calling them communists. But actually, you know, a very interesting fact is that the farmers unions, the Bharatiya Kisan Union, actually, you know, got translations of the bills in Punjabi. And they circulated nearly a thousand, one lakh copies of the bills uh, all over Punjab, you know, which has led to this mass awareness campaign. So, so a lot of people outside Punjab are assuming, no, no, these protests are organized by communists and all, and they're not to be no. taken seriously. But, you know, there's a lot of organic organization which has gone into it because people genuinely feel threatened for their livelihood. Mm. So I know it's a complex issue. I mean, dissecting the farm bills requires economic analysis, some understanding of agriculture. But the people who are protesting outside Delhi, actually, they have come after mobilization because they have actually read the bill in Punjabi. They have understood what implications it might have uh, for their livelihood. That's why they're there. Right. So, 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 so what I'm trying to say is that irrespective of the line of work that you take, you know, whether it is corporate law or litigation or research, there is in India a huge market, a huge scope for, you know, communicating the law in your own respective languages. And that's something that we should be mindful of. Okay, so I think we extended on that theme. But uh, what we'll pick on from uh, Monday, I guess now, because we're out of time, is the more technical part that we need for your seminar papers. Uh, so the construction of arguments, I'll just give you a simple form that you can use uh, to develop arguments as you write uh, in your seminar papers. And you can have a look at these slides in advance so that we can use examples next time. Uh, and the next slide is uh, some ideas on how to construct rebuttals uh, and refutation. Uh, so we'll get straight into this uh, on Monday's class, and I'll use some examples, uh, which hopefully will be of some interest to you, and will allow for some discussion and interaction uh, in the next couple of classes. Right? Okay. So, so I think we can close there sir, because uh, yeah, sorry. Sir, good morning, sir. Uh, after all the discussion, one question was hitting on my mind. According to the intellectuals and according to the research. Uh, uh, philosophers that problem in India is that uh, the lack of uh, English speaking skills but finding a solution to this problem when uh, when innovations when schemes were introduced in India like compulsory English uh, uh, or subject mandatory subject in government schools the same intellectuals were uh, opposing that um, uh, solution to the research problem. Uh, like uh, in Andhra Pradesh, when the uh, legislature have introduced a compulsory medium of uh, English, but the same uh, thing was opposed in that in the High Court. So how come we uh, find uh, the solution to this actual research problem? No, so I, so Shilakha, I think they're two different things. Uh, ah. One is that uh, it's not that research should be conducted only in English. Good research can be conducted in any language, right? The question is that because English has become the language of commerce and international trade uh, and scientific uh, publication, so there's a lot more emphasis on English if you want to reach out to audiences outside the country, right? So, for example, if you want your work to be read by people in other Anglophone countries, English becomes the default language and French and Spanish, of course, have their own influence in other parts of the world. So, I don't think we should accept the statement that research can only happen in English, right? But 
assuming that in india because the legal system largely favors english the civil services the central civil services favor english there is a good argument to say that english is a tool of tool of empowerment that it increases your chances of getting a job in a service sector industry or the chance of getting a government job or for that matter making career progression on your own either in entrepreneurship or other sectors so except i think jagan mohan reddy's decision is right that uh, you must have english taught at least as a separate language right from the early stages but i think the criticism that has come from some people is that in andhra pradesh at the moment you may not have the cadre of teachers who is ready uh, to deliver this uh, in the government schools so i think some of the objections which are coming up practical uh, i know there are some others who have had an older view that you know you would learn better in your mother tongue and in in the primary up till the primary stage you must learn only in your mother tongue uh, but i think that view is now not really given being given too much credence even the courts for instance in karnataka there was a case which went to the supreme court the court clarified that eventually it is the parents and the community's right to decide uh, whether they just ch- ch- the children should study exclusively in their own language but also study in english so i know it's a complex issue and the reality in every state is different in some states there has been less opposition to english uh, in some states there is more uh, but you are you are right i mean in fact professor kanchay laiya points out this contradiction uh, that mm-hmm. very often a, a few people who are opposing uh, the introduction of english in government schools I have sent their own children to to convent schools or convent schools, schools. <laughs> which to teach in English, you know. But that is for the sake of you know public, uh, uh, just to point out the contrast. But but as a policy, I think it's the right decision. Uh, but uh, but I think Dr. Uma possibly knows this field better uh, because yeah. she has colleagues who are teaching in many of the schools uh, in Andhra Pradesh. So so I think she can possibly you know tell you more about uh, about about it from her network. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there is a hypocrisy if you say that you know our own children will study in English, but the working classes should have their children studying only in the vernacular medium i think that's completely a wrong premise and uh, uh, i i would take a slightly different uh, stance mm-hmm. over here and it could this could be entirely mine i will not trust it on anybody that uh, whether you are articulating for english or for one language or for the other language you're being on a monolingual mode mm-hmm. when we know very clearly that you and i are multilinguals so we probably need to see how we have to encash on this or use positively for the, this this multilingualism that we have in school spaces so i am in favor of something called as bilingual education yeah, yeah. wherein you will not say only english or only telugu you will say okay uh, let's have uh, let's have a good blend of these two sub- these two languages in order to teach content and yeah. and and if you looked into the literature on bilingualism itself the whole idea of having only one language in school is in a way to suppress the smartness and the kind of cognitive advantage that you and i have by default as bi bar multilingual so there's a conspiracy theory in action over here no i mean just to conclude quickly i think the andhra pradesh government is not saying displace telugu what they're saying is that english must also be taught it also have english over yeah, there yeah yeah and That's i think the main the main criticism criticism right now is not about the policy per se but the resources and the personnel the that are available. Hmm. yeah also she like okay. if you looked into the questionnaire that was given to parents you know there was a mass question that was given so uh, people opted for english medium in a in a in a in a, in a you know in in that uh, flow of it but when there are crazy people like us who go on to do a second level screening and a second level reading of it and then go on to talk to people and ask ki what is it that you mean by english medium so we went on we did this as a sub research within that larger research and we asked the same subset of parents ki what do you mean by english medium so english medium was everything but english not yeah. not one parent in 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 that entire screening not one parent said that english medium will will give english to our children they said english medium means better socio better infrastructural yeah. facilities english medium yeah, means better time, time management yeah let's yeah no no i'm saying that we've already crossed 12 and i can see i know we should stop here yeah so thank we, you we can extend i think we can pick up the same point next time at a later point oh, yeah, yeah thank you so much okay right right right